Controversy assignment five is available over here on the first class. Check out as you leave. Uh, if you need a copy of the cascade notes, there's still some spares here at the front. And then lastly, the midterms will probably be ready on Friday. They're always done great. I've just got a few more minutes and then hopefully that we get done. So let's take a look at uh, where we went off the top of the test on Q4. We finished up cascade control. Uh, cascade control is the type of control that we apply to enhance our feedback control when we don't get access to the points. Feedback is another type of way of enhancing our system, but it's totally different from feedback. We don't use feedback at all. It's only a new type of control. So the name is different as well. So you have to have those clear in your mind. Cascade actually uses feedback. It's got an inner loop feedback and an outer loop feedback. The P4 control by its nature is a totally different system. So one way you can consider P4 control, and you've all used it in your personal life, um, when you're driving or cycling, you take preemptive action to avoid obstacles. That's a form of P4 control. Um, another example might be you in this room, let's say, and we know that the room loses a significant amount of heat when the sun sets. You may keep the furnace on in advance of the sun setting, so that by the time the sun sets and the room cools down, we keep the room up at the same temperature. So you put it in advance action into the system. That's the key idea of heat forward. You take action to anticipate the heat disturbance. We also need to be forward controls in the opposite way. Let's say we know the sun is rising and we're going to get sun coming into this room. Then there's no need to apply heat because we're going to get that heat coming from free from the sun. So here's another interesting thing to remember for your career. Disturbances can actually work to your advantage. We normally don't like disturbances at all. Disturbances cost us money. But sometimes disturbances work in our favor. That example of the sun rising, coming into your windows, you're getting the heat in the room for free. You don't need to turn your furnace on. So you're actually, what we, we use the expression, we ride the disturbance. You use the disturbance to your advantage and let it ride through the system in, your, in the direction that's favorable to you. Sometimes disturbances are unfavorable, but there's actually instances where disturbances really are beneficial. Okay, so don't have this idea that disturbances are always a, a, a bad thing. You can work in our favor. So let's take a look then here at this disturbance we're facing in the system. <coughs> Consider the tank that we've been looking at the past few classes. We've got a temperature that we're controlling on the outlet of that tank. And our key disturbance we're focused on here this time is the feed temperature. Okay, nuts. So the heat temperature is coming into the tank and it's dropped. The temperature is dropping and so the contents of this tank are going to cool down. If we allow that disturbance to propagate through the tank, it's going to show up here on the output. So heat forward really works well in this it's because of that long delay between when the disturbance enters and the effect on the outlet. So if we can take preemptive action to counteract that disturbance, then we're providing effective feed forward control. So let's take a look at this diagram as it is. We haven't got feed forward on the drawing there yet. We've added it in today's class. So let's just draw the block flow diagram of the system as is, right? Then we're going to see where feed forward fits into the picture. So this is a, just a regular feedback controller right there. We're controlling T2 as my control variable. So we'll start, start over here. And I'm going to start a lot lower because I'm leaving a lot of space to add the feed forward stuff above. So let's just start with feedback. I've got T2. That's my control variable that I'm interested in. So that's my CV. Now, T2 is going to be affected by the process, the process transfer function GP, and my GP needs an input. What's the input to my process? Come on, I need you guys to wake up. 
GP, input to the process. What is always the input to the process transfer function block? Okay, the manipulated variable. What is the manipulated variable in this case? The percent opening of that valve. So coming into GP here is percent open of the valve. That's my MP. Let's take T2 back. We're going to, this is a regular feedback controller. We see T2 is manipulating the valve. So if that's my control variable over there, let's feed it back. And we have T2 set point over there. So set point coming in. We do our usual comparison of the signal to create the error. So create the error. And we always send the error to our controller, our controller transfer function GC. What is the output from GC? Not a trick question. Output from the controller. What's the label for the singer GC? So I need to guess. The manipulated variable. So we're simply manipulating the percentage opening on that valve. So it's a regular feedback controller. Nothing, nothing special here so far. MP, CV, and set points are all in the regular places. Let's take a look at the disturbance. Where does the disturbance fit in on this diagram? Where do we normally put our disturbance? After GP. Okay, so let's draw our disturbance coming in here. By disturbance, We'll call it GD of S, and the disturbance this time is T1. And as Chris says, we put it in just after GP. So we'll put in one of these additive blocks. That indicates a plus and a plus. We bring the disturbance in over there. for everyone so far. Let's take a look now. I just want to give some new names here. So just give me a little bit more space. I'm just going to bump this GP back a little bit. Okay, I'm going to call this signal moving GP. I'm going to call that my control variable part A. And I'm going to pull the signal coming down from the disturbance by control variable part B. Okay, so that control variable, T2, that we measure, T2 is made up of two pieces. It's the piece that tells us that if we open and close its valve, what is this additional heat added to the system is going to raise or lower T2. But T2 is also affected by another part of the process, T1. If T1 drops or increases, that change in temperature over there will also affect T2. So T2, that signal T2 is made up of two pieces. So let me ask this question now. GD is a transfer function. Let's say, assume it's a first order transfer function. What is going to be the gain of GD? What numeric value and sign? will GD have for the game? If GD were of the form <coughs> KB over tau S plus 1, what is going to be the gain and the magnitude of KB? Positive gain. Okay, so KB greater than 0 for sure. 
I make some intuitive sense of temperature, T1 drops, T2 will drop. We need to be able to understand this because we need to figure out how what GD is. Okay, so we know that KD is going to be a positive sign. What number is KD going to be? What does that transit function G E tell me? What does any transit function tell me? <coughs> okay. The key is how much the output changes for a given change in the input. And K D tells us what the long term change is. So what the ultimate change is going to be. So if I raise the temperature of my input, T1, by 2 degrees Celsius, what am I going to see on the output over here? It's also got to get raised by 2 degrees. This is the piece, this signal over here is the incremental amount by which T2 changes. So if I change my input flow by 2 degrees, so my input temperature by 2 degrees, ultimately I will see a 2 degree increase coming out here on the other side. Just by pure energy balance. The key thing you need to understand to, to get that interpretation is that this is a transfer function between T1 and T2 only, ignoring everything else. GD tells you only what happens between this input and this output. So that's a key insight that you must be able to come to intuitively when I'm looking at this drawing, based on your engineering knowledge as well. So T1 represents my disturbance input, GD represents how that input travels through and affects T2 ultimately. And our goal today is to design a feed-forward controller so that when we measure T1, we can take some preemptive action to avoid T1 changing T2. That's our goal. That's the, always the goal of feed forward. Is we don't want the CV to move at all. We want the CV ideally to simply be a continual flat line. So what can we change in our process so that when T1 changes, we see nothing happening at the control variable? That's the goal of feed forward. We want nothing to happen. And uh, we went through some criteria last time. We'll come back to this again in a minute. The thinking is, in this feed forward controller, is if T1 drops, we said last time we worked through the, the, thing, the engineering thinking on this process, if T1 should drop, that temperature drops, we need to add more heat to the system. We need to open that valve add more heat to the system and add just enough heat to counteract the loss of heat due to T1 drop. So we went through this drawing here last time and said, let's take a look at what happens if T1 drops. Here's this green curve represents T1 falling. Should T1 drop, we will see CVA drop. So let's take a look what CVA is. Here's CV. Oh, I think I've got the labels. Okay, it's my mistake. Sorry, I've got the label wrong. Like this is CVA and CVB. So should T1 drop, we see this, this decrease in T1. We're going to see over here in CVA this sort of response. Then that's a classic first order response to a step change in T1. T1 drops, T C A will also drop in that sort of first order manner. And if we do nothing over here, take, this is important in this part here, if C V B, this part coming from the process, assume this is in steady state, so nothing's changing over here. If this drops, we're simply going to see T2 drop in the same way. Remember our goal is so that T2 does not drop. We want T2 to simply be a flat line, so a beautiful horizontal line. 
So in order to make sure that T2 stays a beautiful horizontal line, CBB over here should have the opposite shape. So that when I sum these two up, summation of them will lead to a cancellation. I'll get a nice horizontal line. So that's exactly what we do. We'll go open the valve. The only way to get this rise over here is to go make a change to my process. So go change my manipulated variable, the valve opening. Open up the valve, let more heat in. This process transfer function says that when I open the valve, this temperature will rise over here. We want to open that valve just the right way so that the shape of this curve at CDB matches CBA as a mirror image and the summation leads to zero. That's all that feed forward control is, is simply trying to undo the disturbance by manipulating the valve. So if that's the only thing you remember is feed forward control says we want to undo this disturbance over here by making a change down there. And so it's no surprise that all our activity for feed forward control is going to be in this space over here. We're going to measure what T1 is, and we're going to change that valve accordingly. So let's take a look at how we derive that. Well, we derive it quite simply by saying the following. Let's take a look at what CV is. CV is the sum of two signals, A plus B. So CV is the part of CVA plus CVB. So CVA represents the disturbance effect. And CDB represents the process effect. And we would like this to be zero. Zero implies a flat line. So let's take a look at the disturbance effect. Well, the disturbance effect, CDA, that's equal to the disturbance, T1, times GD. So the GD of S, the transfer function, times the disturbance. I'm going to call the disturbance DM sub S. DM sub S because D for disturbance, M indicates that it's measured. So this over here, this is DM of S. And it happens that my disturbance in this example is simply temperature. But it could be, in another case study, it, might, it will be something else. In this example, it's temperature dropping. What's the process effect? The process effect, what's going to be the effect of the process when, when D changes? Well, let's take a look. We're going to create a feed-forward controller, and our feed-forward controller is going to sit, as I said, right over here. So let's add it in. Here's my disturbance T1. And my feed-forward controller is we're going to measure T1, send it to a new transfer function we're going to call GFF, or feed-forward. And that feed-forward controller is going to create an output that's going to tell us how to move the valve. disturbance over here, that's very easy to do, T1 is easy to measure, it's a, it's a simple temperature. Measure that temperature, put it through a transfer function, that transfer function's output is going to tell me how I should change the valve. One way you can, you can consider this is as follows, consider this your manipulated variable over here, this transfer function from the feed forward, GFF, we could call this, for example, MVA. That's the part of the manipulated variable due to feed forward. And this part over here coming from our regular feedback controller, you might call that MVB. That's the part that we normally make as our manipulated variable. So our manipulated variable's total change, MV, 
is the sum of two pieces in the pipe due to feed forward plus the pipe due to feed back. So the valve itself will see MV, but MV is made up of two pieces. And in the past, up to this point in the course, you've never seen the, the feed forward part. Now we're adding, simply making an additional change to the valve in addition to whatever feedback is coming to make. Okay, so let's think about this now. If we want to understand what the disturbance is going to do, the CVB, let's take a look at CVB. CVB sits over here. And if that disturbance comes in, for example, the step change in temperature is going to pass through the feed forward block and then pass through the process block and those two are in series, and we get CVB. So CVB is the disturbance traveling through the feed, the feed forward block <coughs> multiplied by GP. So we can write this then, the process effect, as GFF of S times GP of S times the disturbance. Now you're getting the idea what, what we're doing here. This disturbance comes in through GD and it will affect the temperature, causing T2 to drop. But we also measure the disturbance. We're going to counteract it by making a change in the valve <coughs> opening. That valve openings change will propagate through the process, causing CVB to rise. And what we're going to say is this rise in CVB, the drop in CVA, they're going to add together leading to a net change of nothing on the output. So let's solve this thing for zero. We can uh, pull out the common dm over here, so dm of s. And then we have gd of s plus gff times gp is equal to zero. And because dmf dm is out here as a common element, and there's zero on the right hand side, you can simply drop dm out, simply ignore dm, it's like solving for roots, so we can set dm off to the side, ignore it, and our solution then tells me that gff of s is equal to minus gd of s over gp of s. So this is the key result for feed forward control. I'll write it up here for those of you in the back. Okay. So that feed forward transfer function is simply the ratio of two other transfer functions, GP of S and GP of S, with the negative sign in front of it. CVB is the portion of the controlled variable that travels through the process. Yeah, but like, how do we get that same function? Like, do you get that? Yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at what it is. It's, if DM changes, it travels through the feed forward, comes in over here, travels through the process, and lands up over there. So CVB, that's the portion of CV that gets due to a change in DM. Um, so it's important to so just as a match you can then finish the experience. So let's take a look at an example to try this out. Give it a go and see what the calculations give you for the feed forward transfer function. If we have GP and GD given by the following. process 
transfer function with four e to the minus five s over three s plus one and g d of s was equal to e to the minus seven s over two s plus one. GFF look like? What's the numerator? Negative 4 e to the negative 12. Negative 4 e to the negative 12 s. Any other values? is on the denominator, so we invert and multiply, so that's 3s plus 1, 4e to the minus 5s. Okay. Simplify that out a bit, and you get some cancellation on the e's. You get 3s plus 1, e to the minus 2s on the numerator, and 4 times 2s plus 1 on the denominator. the time delay on GP to be less than the time delay on GD. Okay. 
so that you get an e to the minus something, or at least just get pure cancellation. So you cannot get a positive power of e either, uh, in your numerator. Let's take a look at this in Simulink. Um, so it's a little bit messy. I'll post this again for you to try it out yourself. But let's see what we've done over here. So here's my process. I'm simply considering this part. Okay. I'm not considering the feedback yet. So let's take a look at the process. Here's my process transfer function GP, <coughs> 4 over 3s plus 1 with its time delay. So that's um, this transfer function over here. Here's my disturbance. My disturbance is E to the minus 7s divided by 2s plus 1. And the disturbance comes in and down over here. I call that CBA, following this notation. And CBD is the process transfer function. So I calculate the sum and I get C total. Our feed forward controller, this is the important time to see this fits in. GFF, which we've just calculated, e to the minus 2s, there's a time delay of 2 units in there. There's my minus 3s plus 1. You know, factored in, minus 3s minus 1. Then my denominator is 8s plus 4. So what should CB look like? I run the simulation and I show you what CB is. What should we expect? No one? No guesses yet? No? Uh, flat line. Flat line. Okay, so if you don't get a flat line, you've made a mistake in your simulation, at the very least. So let's check, check that out. So there's four signals coming in there. There's my CB is the, the purple line. It's not that one purple pink. Line gets a flat line at zero. So that does exactly what we expect. CBA is the portion due to the disturbance. It's a rise, you see that? And CBB is a drop that looks exactly like a mirror image of CBA and CBB. So that, that sums together at zero. But what's the most interesting part here, in fact, is the yellow line. The yellow line is this signal over here. <laughs> This part there, the manipulated variable. So let's just go back here and show you what that is. Feed forward MV. That is this signal coming through here just after the feed forward controller. And because in this simulation I've got zero coming in over here, that signal is equivalent to the, the change we're making on the bell. What's, what, why do I say it's the most interesting part here is that. Take a look and see what it's doing. What do you notice about the yellow line relative to the others? It starts earlier, right? It does exactly what feed forward control does, says it should do. It starts to make a change in the valve. Later on, that valve makes a change. There's a bit of a time delay here. And then CBB starts to change afterwards. So CBB, my red line, starts to drop. So exactly correct. You close the valve, CBB, the temperature from the tank, starts to drop because we're putting in less heat, less heat transfer. And this decrease due to lower heat transfer matches exactly what that step is doing in CBA. How did the time line how do you get the time lining up perfectly? That's exactly what's happening over here. Those time delays cancel out just the right amount so that the action occurs exactly in the correct point in time. Okay. So this answers a question that Marina had, which I think we should come back to. It's like, why did we not consider the feedback Controller. Why, when we did this derivation, did I not consider the output from this controller? Well, here's, your, here's the reason why. If our feed forward controller is doing its job perfectly and correctly, this signal will cancel exactly and get you a flat line. 
and T2, in other words, never deviates from its set point. So if we bring the signal around, that's zero, bring it around zero minus zero, we get zero error, the output from this controller is zero, and so we actually, technically, if we've got perfect feed forward, you'd never need feedback. So if you make just the right amount of feed forward control, you'll never really need a feedback controller. But let's see what, it, what does it mean to make perfect feed forward control. Let's take a look at this equation. What does perfect feed forward control require you to know? KP, KD, tau, tau for the disturbance, time delays for the disturbance, time delays for the process. You need to know these two transfer functions exactly. We don't know them exactly. You all have seen when you've done your, um, when you did the process reaction curve experiments, you all got different values for tau, theta, and so on in the final, in the midterm and in, in the assignments. So estimating what GP of S is, is tough. You're never going to get that GP of S perfect. Let's take a look at it and see what happens in the simulation if we don't know that. Let's say, for example, we assume that GP is 3S over, uh, sorry, the denominator is 3s plus 1, but let's say in reality it's maybe 4s plus 1. So we think it's 3, but in reality it's actually 4. If we go run that simulation, take a look at what happens. We don't get perfect cancellation anymore, and we get some deviation then in our control variable. So that's why we need feedback control, at least for that reason. The other reason why we need feedback control is because this is not the only disturbance that comes to our process. Right? There's several other disturbances that, that we will encounter, so we need feedback control to eliminate those other disturbances. And furthermore, we also need feedback control because sometime in the future we're going to want to make set point changes in C2. Right? And you can't make a set point change with the feed forward control. So we always need our feedback, at least for other disturbances and for set point changes. So we only put a uh, feed forward control on major disturbances. So if there's a minor disturbance, it wouldn't be worth it. You wouldn't put your feed forward control on minor disturbances. What does it cost you to put a feed forward control in? Another sensor. And? GFF. You need to put GFF in it somewhere. Okay. So you need another sensor to measure your disturbance, and you need a controller for GFF or this transfer function implementation in a computer somewhere. Okay. So it doesn't come for free. And as William said, you only would put this on major disturbances. Yes, Mark? Is GSF a regular PI controller? OK, is that a regular PI controller? Take a look at the transfer function for it. There's a simple example. But even that simple example doesn't look anything like a feed feedback PI controller. So no, you need to implement this in computer in a digital form. So it's not hard to do. Simulink is doing it right here for you in basic simulations. So it's, it's, it's easy to do that. But it does cost some time now. Another question, how do you get GD? Let's say GD of S, we might assume GD of S is e to the minus Let's make that assumption that it's a first order transfer function. How do you get those three parameters, KD, theta, and tau? Yeah, I was just going to say measure G 
changes in T1, and then you'll get the data from changes in T1 the effect on T2. Okay. And then calculate the sum over the report. Right. It's really hard to calculate what GD is. If you think about the practicality of it, you can't go make step changes in D. Why not? So the reason why it's a disturbance. The disturbance is something you cannot go change. Right? So those fluctuations in temperature or in whatever the disturbance is, you cannot go, go make a change in them. If you were able to make a change in them, you would go make a change so that they didn't impact your process, right? That's why we call it a disturbance. So we really cannot actually go make changes up and down. The best we can do, as Mark said, William said, is simply go observe what T1 is from historical data and see what its effect is over here on temperature to try and figure out what GD is. And so the calculation of what GD is is not a, a trivial um, exercise. And in fact, it's sort of beyond the level of what this course looks at. It's more in the realm of statistics and data analysis. But we can figure out what GD is in, in, in some cases. So we need to know GD. We need to know GP, and once you have those two, you can go ahead and calculate and implement GFF. So let's take a look then just to, to finish up this example. I think we've covered everything for, for that, that I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah. Uh, presumably, in like a real world situation, you would have a feed coming in, right? For, for a temperature example, let's say you have a feed coming in and the temperature is unsure. Couldn't you just replace that feed with a feed of a known temperature and see how that would affect it, and then just use that transfer function as the GD transfer Right, so that's a, that's a good example where you, you might be able to control that disturbance, but there are many disturbances you have no control of. Okay. So for example, many petroleum plants are very sensitive to the temperature outside, right. right? So the distillation column loses more heat on a cold day than on a hot day, and so that heat loss, that disturbance, needs to be counteracted by the reboiler. That's not a disturbance we can go manually make a step change to. Right. Okay. So there's many disturbances of the type where we can't, but there are some, like you said, where you might be able to. Uh, the rest of the slides here, we've, we've, I've covered implicitly on the board already. This one I've covered. This one um, I've spoken a little uh, about. We've done a derivation. The one thing to consider here is this slide, which just simply looks at what the speed forward controller looks like in a general situation where we've got tau for the denominator for the process and tau for the disturbance. So the terminology is over here. Tau for the process we call tau p for the lead time and tau for the disturbance we call the lag. That terminology of lead and lag comes again from electrical engineering. Um, it's what have, we call a lag the time constant that's on the denominator and we call a lead the time constant that's on the numerator. Lag is an obvious one because, as you know, our deno denominator time constants tell us how the process responds to a change. It's how the process lags behind the input. A lead on the numerator is, is the exact opposite of that. And there's this criteria that we need that the disturbance time delay always needs to be greater than the process time delay. If you get the situation where theta d is smaller than theta p, in other words, you get a situation where your, your feed forward controller might have e to the plus 6s. Let's say you calculated that your numerator had an e to the plus 6s term. All you simply do is ignore it. Recognize we can't predict into the future. So if you get a positive e to the something s, you simply drop it off. We, you can't physically implement that sort of feed forward control. You just, you know, it's one, it's just, just drop it off. Yeah, just drop it off as a one. Okay, uh, this one is not. There's nothing really interesting here that I want to talk about. Let's just uh, take a look though at this slide. This talks about how you can identify a feed forward controller on a P and I lead. Take a look at what's happening over here. You know, let's reference it back to this diagram. So here's T1 by disturbance coming in to step down. Where does the feed forward controller sit 
it sits between my manipulated variable, as I said at the start of the class, it sits between my percentage opening and my disturbance. So somewhere in between that, those two points, we need a feed forward control. So let's take a look at that. There's my disturbance T1 I'm measuring. There's my valve opening. So I need a feed forward controller somewhere in between here. And you notice there's actually two new pieces to this diagram that you've not seen before. TY1 and TY2. What are those? A Y on a PNID represents, what might you think it represents? We know what A's and C's and F's and T's and P's mean, but a Y is something that's new for us. What does a Y mean? A Y means a calculation, it means it's any type of calculation. And sometimes we get a little bit of a hint what that calculation is. So let's take a look at this first one. It says we measure T1 and we send T1 into this new circle, TY1. TY1 is a calculation. This is TY1. There's your TY1. It's a feed forward transfer function. A Y represents any general calculation. And in this particular instance, GFF would be this sort of calculation. That when given an input, GFF is a transfer function that has an input and an output. So the input to GFF is the disturbance dm. So given that input disturbance, it will calculate an output for us by moving it through this transfer function. So we implement this transfer function in the computer system to generate an output. So there's my output coming through here now. Let's follow this along this diagram. So here's my output. What do you think TY2 represents? It's this guy here, the summation. Right? So TY2 is the summation, and we get a hint of what that calculation is by the plus sign that's over there. That plus sign will be on the P and ID diagram, and it says calculate your output here and add it to whatever the output would have been from TC2. TC2 is your feedback control on T2. T2 is here, here's my feedback controller. GC is this guy over here. So TC2 is represented by this feedback controller. And then TY2 says add those two signals together and then send it onto your valve. So the feedback you do, well, before you still need to manipulate the valve. Oh, you did the valve. Both, same valve. That's the key insight to feed forward. Feed forward says take whatever you're already manipulating and simply add to it or take away from it to undo the disturbance. So rather than wait for the disturbance to come through the process and be measured, take preemptive action.